Welcome to the AI Grapple with Kate Vandervoort from Social Mediology. In today's episode, we lift the lid on AI and explore why 80% of AI projects fail. My guest is Dr. Evan Sheltier. He is an expert in artificial intelligence with a PhD in game theory from the Nobel Prize winning University of Bielefeld in Germany. He has almost two decades of international experience in the development and design of AI tools for a variety of industries, having worked with the world's top companies on all aspects of advanced analytical solutions from optimization to machine learning in applications from eight HR to oil and gas and robotics to supply chain. Evan is the Managing Director and CEO of Ubity, an innovative global recruitment marketplace connecting employers to specialist agencies. He is also an Amazon best-selling author and his latest book, Why Data Science Projects Fail, The Harsh Realities of Implementing AI and Analytics Without the Hype, is just being released. So check out the show notes for all the details. Let's dive into this fascinating conversation. The AI grapple, where the future begins. Hi, Evan. It's great to have you here. Hey, Kate. It's fantastic to join you. So let's get started with you telling us a bit about your background and your journey to working with AI. Well, that's, that's a good place to start, especially given that from an AI perspective, I think I was one of these individuals that was kind of probably destined to a degree because I still remember back in grade two when the uh, our teacher at the primary school, I went to a, a small primary school here in Brisbane, handed out this math sheet and, and it was basically all the kids needed to do it to, to check where they are at in, in their math journey going through primary school. And I think I took this little math sheet as a competition to be the first in the class to, to complete it. And so I raced through it, did it all, and proudly ran up to the teacher's desk and slammed it down and said, done, kind of as the first in the class. Somehow I managed to get a reasonably high mark on that little math exam, and I took it from there that this was the direction to follow in. And so I guess ever since a little kid, I've kind of been very focused on mathematics. From there, cutting a long story short, I went through the University of Queensland studying maths and then over to Germany to the Nobel Prize winning institute at uh, the Institute for Mathematical Economics in Bielefeld and did a PhD over there in applied mathematics, in particular in areas like game theory. And since then have been working, building AI tools all around the world. So I've worked in Sweden, worked in Melbourne, worked in Brisbane, worked across the United States, just building tools that help organizations run their businesses better. How do we make better decisions? How do we better utilize the resources we've got? And and starting from a desktop type focus, that was in particular in advanced manufacturing, robotics, building robotic systems to, to manufacture vehicles and to simulate vehicles, all the way through to things like rostering and supply chain optimization in the current role leveraging artificial intelligence to improve the whole recruitment process. So it's it's been quite a journey spanning many, many industries and, and kind of a real reflection, I think, to some degree of who I am, kind of an intellectually curious individual that likes to see the impact of, of the work he's doing. Oh, I love that. And I love talking to people like you because I'm a front-end user of AI and, you know, I've got a little bit of knowledge of what's under the hood and how it all works, but I um, I love speaking to people who truly understand the nuts and bolts of, of all of this and how it works. And I also love what you just said, because for me, I think AI, if we use it well and use it properly, it actually helps us to be more and better of who we are as opposed to, you know, this concept of AI replacing us. So I'm really, um, I love that you've kind of found that AI, you know, it's helped you find your place in the world. <laughs> and, and it's such a good point you make around AI replacing us. I feel there's a lot of fears. And and we're going to talk later a bit about a book that me and, me and the global director of supply chain analytics at Walmart wrote. And when we were writing it to him, his name's Doug Gray. I asked Doug, and, and, and his, his background's incredible. He's won two Franz Edelman's awards, which is effectively the Nobel Prize in, in applied analytics and industry. And he's been part of two other teams that have won it. So he's got like four associated with him. You can imagine any scientist on the planet with four Nobel Prizes associated would just be incredible. And this is him. And I said to him, I asked him one day, hey, Doug, 
out of all the projects you've done over almost 40 years of building some of the world's biggest analytic systems, and he himself works on systems, I think, last year that were saving in the hundreds of millions of dollars for Walmart, just himself and his team. I said, out of all these systems, how many have been fully automated? How many took humans out of the loop and eradicated jobs? And, and he concurred with me that it would be less than 5% ever that have done that. And the only ones that ever did it probably weren't even properly AI. They would have been robotic process automation, which would have just been some back office task that just got automated that people didn't want to do anyway. Like it was just reconcile these numbers or something like that. Probably not even that because you'd want a human to review that, but just kind of like automatically populate these fields for this for this database. Just really basic stuff. So it's 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 definitely not the world of humans disappearing. We neither me nor him are seeing that in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, Ned, look, we've got some questions I want to go into, but just on that point, I think one of the things um that I'm seeing a lot of, and I'm sure you do too, is this misconception or the the lack of understanding around the difference between AI, automation, and robotics, which are three very different things. Um, how do you help people understand that difference? Because I'm finding a lot of companies that I'm working with are, are still just seeing it as automation. And it's so, you know, AI is so much more than that. Yeah, look, we've got to unpack it a little bit from a business perspective and talk the language of the people that we're talking and then and, and use their language of the people we're talking to. If we walk in talking all sorts of technical mumbo jumbo, no, no one understands anything you're saying. And so the way I'll typically unpack it, because a lot of my career has actually been more in optimization. And, and for the purists out there, optimization isn't a form of AI. People won't consider that. Uh, from a purely uh, technical perspective, AI people see as a prediction technology and optimization is a prescription. So often what, what I'll do is I'll talk to people a little bit around like, what are you trying to do? If in the first instance, you're trying to know what the best course of action is, how should I do this to get the best profit? Then I'm going to say that's an optimization technology. And most of the data scientists that will come out of university, but not all of them, will tend to lean more towards the, the pure AI and not that type of automation technology. And the pure AI kind of sits in the prediction space. If we look at ChatGPT, if we look at uh, uh, DALI, Sora, all these, these incredible multimodal artificial intelligence technologies, they're really just great big prediction engines. All ChatGPT does is predicts the next word. All Sora does is predict what color a pixel should be on a video. And, and, and the other tools that will create a music track for that will predict what noise, what, what sound should come out of it. And that's, they're just predicting. And that's the same as a forecasting tool that will forecast next year's revenues, right? You'll take your historical data and you use that to forecast next year's revenues, some statistical machine learning approach, similarly with ChatGPT and these other tools. And so you're asking the question, one is, I want to know what's going to happen next. And that's, that's your kind of normal AI, what, what fits in the AI bucket. The next one is, given that information, what action should I take? What's the most important action to actually do? And that's optimization. And then if we wind our way back for many organizations that may not be quite uh, capable enough to, to tackle those kind of more sophisticated use cases, it might just be get me a view of my data and try and help me answer questions around it using diagnostic and descriptive techniques to, to be able to look in the rear view mirror and know what's happened to make decisions going forward or, or try and investigate the data to answer these questions. And at the end of the day, any of these technologies, all they're trying to do is help us make a decision. That's what it's all about. Help Can't make a decision. AI, though, help us with the optimization task? So I know in, you know, I have a relatively small business. I'm not in a multinational company. But a lot of um, smaller to medium-sized businesses are certainly using AI to have those conversations, I guess, with data, yeah. which helps with optimization. I guess it's hard for a lay person like us to, you know, see that delineation because there is there is kind of that gray area in between where um, it does appear to, whether that's what it's actually doing or not, be providing yeah. advice or optimization solutions, I guess. Yeah, it's a very closely intertwined area. In fact, most of the large uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, deep neural networks, and that leverage optimization techniques to be able to provide a, a algorithm that functions well. So most of them will leverage that. Uh, the chat GPT and those type of tools can help you discover which optimization technique you should use, but they're a fundamentally different technology. They won't optimize anything. 
Like if, if you handed a set of staff, for example, at a childcare center that you need to optimize to minimize the cost of the roster, to maximize the enjoyability of working that roster, a predictive machine learning or deep neural network is not going to be able to do that effectively apart from potentially looking at historical rosters, which you're saying which ones are good and which ones are bad, and then trying to predict what a good or bad roster is in that particular situation. But that's a bad way to go about it. Like you're approaching a screw with a hammer. We need a screwdriver, which is an optimization tool here, to be able to solve that kind of problem. That's a fundamentally different thing. It requires a fundamentally different skill set. It requires fundamentally different tools. Um, It requires fundamentally different approaches to data, business problems, ROIs, everything. It's a very different set of technologies. And I think for organizations, what I'm seeing is a blurring and confusion of that, of handing their internal data science team a problem and saying it is AI, but it's 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 really very nuanced. And they simply don't have the capability to solve that kind of thing. Mm. I, I think our, our next question is going to maybe take us back a step, which I think we maybe need to explore that a little deeper. So you've got a huge amount of experience in developing and commercializing AI and optimization technologies. Um, can you share some of the most common reasons why you think they fail? And I think we've just started into that. Um, but yeah. I know your book, Why Data Science Projects Fail, um, goes deep into that. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, look, that, that was a fascinating project writing this book, and it answers this question kind of head on, like well, what's going wrong in the world? Because I think one of the things that many people don't realize when they get caught up in the hype is just how hard AI projects are. They're very hard. They're complex. They're difficult. They involve people. It's not just data and technology. It runs across the whole business. It needs to align with the strategy, ideally. And really what people don't recognize over 80 percent of these projects typically fail that's what kind of the anecdotal evidence suggests but there have been rigorous scientific peer-reviewed studies that confirm those kind of numbers that a massive number fail and in fact we shouldn't be surprised because another area that's quite related in terms of the complexity of the problems that you're trying to solve are startups most startups fail we know that over a 10-year period over 90 percent of startups will fail it's 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 that's been well documented and well understood and ai projects in theory should be no different due to the similar levels of complexity that organizations are facing and so what we're finding across businesses is really a high failure rate that organizations simply are unaware of and they're jumping into these ai projects and they're burning themselves badly very badly one of the things that that me and doug gray doug is my co-author as i mentioned earlier from walmart explore there first of all is understanding with complexity comes a lot of work and that means a high price tag and so building ai tools internally and not just leveraging ones off the shelf we're seeing costing a, a, a properly polished one from 200 to 500 grand usd sort of at the low level up to 50 million usd at the high level some systems that we describe in our book cost the hundreds of millions to build right US can we actually, can we go back just one step? And when we're talking AI projects, because I think that's really interesting for people, you know, AI projects means a, a, there's a huge variety within that of what AI projects might look like. So do you want to give us some examples just so people really know what we're talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. There's a huge variety. And I'm going to focus a little bit on the business operations side of things. And an example could simply be, uh, I want to forecast future demand for for a product in a retail setting. So I want to know how many milk cartons am I going to sell in the coming future? Or I might want to forecast in a hospital the number of presentations in an emergency department. Or I might want to forecast future revenues for my business based on these kind of conditions. Or I might want to uh, forecast uh, the next word that is most likely based on the text that I'm writing on my phone. So using some... uh, uh, prediction to, to be able to assist me with um, auto suggestions on, on my smartphone when I'm writing. So that's a whole bunch of, of kind of predictive technologies that can help organizations and people do things better. Other ones that are optimization front could be, I want to roster the staff across my business. I'll be running a fast food chain. I've got casual staff I need to bring in there. How do I roster them to meet the demand that I'm predicting will arrive at my store? And there's many organizations that have famously done that here in Australia from Domino's uh, through to many others that work and they want to, they don't want to overstaff because that'll cost them too much money, but they want to make sure customers have a great experience. They can meet the demand in a timely fashion, according to their brand promise. 
then you've also got things like optimizing the delivery of, of vehicles around a network when you're trying to deliver packages. So that's your FedEx, your DHL, your Australia Post, all those type of organizations. They're, they're kind of sets of use cases and all the way through the most obvious ones that are coming up where tools like uh, ChatGPT, which is uh, a large scale uh, tool with billions of parameters that have been trained on huge corpuses of data that can then produce cogent and coherent text for us to be able to use in marketing settings, in uh, in note-taking settings, in, in, in uh, data extraction settings, and a variety of other type of use cases that, that we might have to be able to run our business more efficiently. Yeah, amazing. And so... Do you see a fairly clear differentiation? Because most of the work that I'm doing is absolutely in that generative AI, large language model space, as opposed to these deep vertical integrations and technology where companies are, you know, paying to customise a solution for them. Um, Do you weigh those differently in terms of failure rates, success rates, and, and how do you go about measuring whether something is a... A failure or a success? Brilliant questions. Brilliant questions. So for the first one there, when we talk about it, initially we've got our own anecdotal evidence when we in the book. We can we can talk about the projects that are found. Now, luckily me and Doug, and I don't want us to sound special, we've been very fortunate that very few of both of our projects have failed. And that's kind of been down to the way we've approached the projects we've worked on. And that probably led to a large reason why we wrote this book. We're both incredibly technology focused. Doug is as technical as I am, if not even more so. Uh, he, as mentioned, he's, he's won a number of, of Franz Edelman Awards, which is effectively the Nobel Prize in Advanced Analytics Application. So he's incredibly technical. But we both realized that the causes of failure and the reasons for failure just simply weren't technical. And so uh, what, what we're seeing uh, in that space in terms of the the actual uh, uh, split it's more just the data we refer to so we go and look at that data and we're just seeing the look in general it's about an 80 percent failure rate which is which is quite problematic and when we go and delve into that and and try and understand and peel back the layers of the onion and go okay what's going wrong it, it really starts fleshing up this this big set of common reasons that we just keep seeing occurring over and over again with a long tail of, of just more sporadic issues. So there's really 80-20 kind of thing going on there that's causing it and we're seeing leading to a lot of the failures uh, uh, around AI projects. It's still, sorry, <laughs> it looks like it froze for a moment. I'll cut that bit out. <laughs> no, not a problem. Um, so w- in your book, when you start talking about you know, some of the more realities because we were talking offline beforehand that, you know, there's a lot of marketing bros and gals out there who are evangelizing uh, AI and the potential and the possibility and making it the be all and end all. But when you start to look at those harsh realities, um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that organizations, and we've started to touch on this, but that they have about AI projects and how can they maybe avoid falling into some of those traps? Yeah, good point. So there's there's a, there's a couple of things here that we see kind of recurring over and over again. I think part of the misconception is getting caught up in the hype cycle right now and feeling like there's a requirement to react and to do something immediately. I think there's a lot of organizations that feel in that space. Unless your business is an AI business and is competing against OpenAI directly or Google directly in this space. I don't think there is that pressure to be able to react. And so what we're seeing when we look at the failures is things in in that 80-20 sort of part, that the majority of the reasons is just basic stuff that's got nothing to do with AI. It's got to do with simply running your business well. And, And some of the two biggest reasons that we keep seeing occurring over and over again was simply something as simple as failing to build the need in the organization. So there's simply a poor use case, no clear business value, no actionable insights, a solution looking for a problem, or, or even there's just simply no buy-in from upper management. So, so there's a lack of leadership. So it's a, it's a team itself that started down in the business doing their own little side hustle that simply aren't aligned with the organization. And, and that's causing long-term problems. The other big ones, and these reasons are, are, are ones that are well known, is things around data quality and reliability related issues. So they simply just don't have the data. It's just 
they've never been a data-driven organization. And overnight, they decide they want to do AI and say, well, let's do AI without properly understanding all the complexity that's involved with it. Let's say if it's a retail organization and they were to say overnight, we want to suddenly move from selling handbags uh, to selling jackets. I mean, you wouldn't suddenly expect your team overnight to be able to produce a top a top selling line of jackets. It just doesn't happen and they'd never request that. But because there's a lack of knowledge and understanding in the AI space and, and a lot of vendors out there would love to make it look really simple, there's this kind of let's do it sort of thing. And so the data's not in place. It hasn't been thought through from a strategic perspective what matters. There's a lack of understanding where the low-hanging fruit is. There's also clearly a lack of the right resources because if the right resources were there, these questions wouldn't come up like this. And really throughout the book, we unpack these and, and tell a lot of stories around it too because what we wanted to do, there wasn't just this one part of doing this really deep and, and thorough research, which we did to carry out to try and understand what the major causes of failure but what I think is really important for, for a lot of executives and individuals in organizations is then to try and make that real. I think just giving a list of reasons of what went wrong without actually pointing out, now here's some concrete examples, in it, is it in itself a failure? I think you really need to make it practical and pragmatic and say, well, here's an example of that. And, and throughout the whole book on almost every single example of a failure, we then try and tell a story to make it real. And we do that across a huge variety of industries as well. To, to reveal to people uh, what the what the kind of that failure looks like in real life. And I think that's why, you know, education, training and that culture change that really needs to happen within an organisation has got to be the first step because a lot of the work I'm doing is right at that very front end well before a company is ready for any kind of AI project or integration, but it's that how do we get everyone in the organisation or the company really understanding what is AI, what does that actually mean for us, where is the potential, where is the opportunity, and giving that education. And it's probably, um, I probably work in a very different way to you in that I'm not data-driven, uh, but a lot of what I'm doing is, you know, encouraging that sense of play and curiosity and people can't break it. And I think the large language models is a really good place for people to start to understand. And that moment where they sort of see the cursor jumping across the screen and kind of get that, oh, there, there's something happening here that's really quite interesting. Uh, but giving people an opportunity to experience that and to truly understand what that means then I think opens up the possibility and that's when it becomes critical to put in place all of those things that you're talking about to ensure the success of any project. And you're right. I mean, none of the businesses that I'm working with really have got the data right to be doing these deep vertical integration pieces of work around big AI projects. So how do you, you know, I think a lot of the work I do is bridging that gap or starting to build the bridge to that gap, but how do you build the bridge from the other side? So how do you yeah. meet those businesses that are not there yet, that, that don't have um, yeah, and, you know, it's like working in social media where, yeah. sure, you can do the best social media strategy, but if the whole back end of website and conversion and funnels and all of that's not there, it's never going to be successful. So how do you, I'm building the bridge from this side, how do you build the bridge from the other side to help people get there? Look, I think almost what I need to do is jump across and help you build that bridge back <laughs> over because that's where Please. it's really got to start. It's it's got yeah. to start there at the business strategy and commercial level. Like, and this has been almost done to death. This kind of comment, and I recognise that for many listeners, they'll they'll have heard this before. But let's unpack it a little bit to make it a little bit more nuanced and interesting and and, and relevant for readers. So, listeners, sorry. So, what we want to do is is not just start at that top level. What's the business strategy and how AI can fit into it. But we need to start, especially for an organization that doesn't have AI capabilities, how do they even start on that journey? How do you go from zero to one? And I think that's the hardest thing for, for many an organization that's got no AI capabilities. They can go and get a whole bunch of external consultants, but how do they know they're not getting the wool pulled over their eyes and ripped off? Because they've got no way to judge it. And what I think and what I feel very strongly about this kind of approach is that we need to start small and build the capability internally. Because if you're fully outsourcing it and you're saying, look, this is strategically important, that's a problem, right? Especially because it's your data and you should know your own data as a business to have it under control. 
And so how we go from zero to one for me is lots of small steps. We divide that zero to one segment up into lots of little decimal values and fractions, and we're going to walk along all those fractions to get to one. And the first step really for any organizations, what I say is, let's get that business strategy, right? Let's look at what they want to do. And I think as a business, they need to have some capability of data. Otherwise, how is their financial team running the business? Those people in the finance, at least, are going to have to have some view of the data and understand what's going on with the business to know how healthy it is. And so I think we begin there. We start building out dashboards and visualizations and just getting a view of let's become data driven. Let's look at the business and understand where it is by looking at the data, first of all. And when you start doing that and you build up things like dashboard and just looking at it, and as a business, any executive could look at those numbers and be able to sense check them straight away at their intuition and go, that's right or wrong. Right. They could know and look at that kind of stuff and go, yep, that's, that's good or bad. And we can see from there we've started the ball rolling. We're on our journey. We're just starting to look at our own data. Let's look at our own data and we know whether we can trust it or not. And once we started looking at our own data, I think that starts building up the next steps. We get a bit of a feeling for data. We get a bit of an understanding. And we start doing more complicated things with data. And that could just be extrapolating trends. So we saw that trend in the history has been like this. I can extrapolate that trend again as an executive. I can overlay, do I believe that or not? Right? And extrapolating that trend can be done in Excel and in many tools. Many tools out of the box will let you extrapolate trends. And you can see we're building our maturity in the organizations. And we can see when that extrapolation makes no sense, that data is broken back here. We need to fix it. And then what we're realizing is, oh, wait a second, all our processes within the business to manage our data don't work. So why don't we tackle that first? And so you're building this really solid foundation, which is aligned with the strategy the whole way through. Because it's being driven by the executives and it's being driven top down. And what they're doing is they're answering questions that are relevant for them, i.e. that are strategically important. And so we're starting to build capability. Now, admittedly, for those who wanted a quick win and from yesterday to today, they want an AI solution, that's not going to suit them. But I can tell you what's going to suit you even less is losing millions of dollars trying to do that and actually joining the 80% club of failures. Yeah, it's such a balancing act though, isn't it? Because so much of what we're seeing is that bottom up where, and you know, you've got the extremes, you've got those staff who are putting data on a USB, sneaking home and feeding it into chat GPT to cheat and do their work uh, in what they see more efficiently. Um, but it's, because part of that culture is how do you not dampen the enthusiasm of those who can see some potential and really want to start using this in their role? And maybe that is the difference between that sort of business aligned, large, deep AI project, um, as opposed to how can they might, you know, maybe use AI just to lift productivity in some of the tasks that they perform. And so it's such an interesting dilemma for all of us that are working in this space is how do we uh, build that culture in a way that brings everybody along on the journey? And right. um, I'm probably people like yours worst nightmare in some ways when I'm encouraging people to get in and have, uh, you know, have a go and see the possibilities because um, I'm finding a lot of senior leadership in the companies I'm um, working with at the moment, don't even see the potential or the opportunity. And it's actually people day to day, those frontline knowledge workers who can really see the opportunity immediately and who are bringing that to the fore within the organization. Absolutely. And let's, let's take marketing for an example, right? If marketing has been given an overall strategy from the business, they they will nowadays be using artificial intelligence some way, shape, or form. I'm guaranteeing you one of their tools, even if not directly, indirectly. They'll be running a Google AdWords campaign or a Facebook campaign, and it'll be using maybe enhanced bidding techniques or something in AdWords that'll, that'll be just artificial intelligence to choose a bid price to make sure your ads get served in the top three um, via Google AdWords. Or even Facebook, it's using it to try and target the right audiences. So even if you're not using it directly, using it indirectly. And what can help succeed in these type of scenarios, as long as marketing's aligning the usage of AI with the strategy, they should be good. But there's one other caveat that they need to pay attention to here, and this is becoming more and more relevant. It's around the guidelines and policies internally of using AI, right? And what I think management can do and upper levels can do is enable those lower down levels instead of by fiat starting in an organization pushing AI down, which just won't work. Each of the division's usage is going to be different. And, and those frontline workers are going to know best what works or what doesn't work, to be honest with you. And so what, what we'll see is, is more a top-level set of guidelines. Here's what happens. For example, don't upload any private information up into ChatGPT. Um, 
if you happen to be in a sector that has a high risk usage of AI, be more careful about biases, about representativeness, about fairness, about all these different ethical issues that go with it. And in addition, make sure the data that you're using is is valid and 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 can serve the purpose that we're trying to serve with this. And then you can get these little parts of the business that become little champions and leveraging AI. And I think those kind of quick wins, so to speak, uh, within that part of the business can help it grow across the rest of the business in particular when other people can see the success that's going on there. But I think you're exactly right in that a lot of this stuff from the use cases cannot come from the top. Right? They just won't know each part of the business as well as the parts of the business. Well, what can come from the top is a set of guidelines and the top can do those guidelines and policies. They can. AI is no different to any other tool. If you've got an IT policy, you can have an AI policy. It, it really isn't some totally new world. The same set of principles that apply in IT will apply in AI or that apply in other parts of your business will apply here. It's a business commercial thing and you'll set up the rules around it. Obviously, you'll get people leaning in and giving you feedback on that, but it really shouldn't be a hyper complex thing. And you can see from there, the parts of the business themselves can, can then leverage it. And some of the policies and guidelines are eminently practical. For example, one, I've worked on a number of policy documents for organizations. One is no AI gets to go out the door without a human simply seeing it. And the second thing is, is the usage of AI doesn't take away accountability. An excuse was that, no, no, ChatGPT wrote this marketing copy for me is not an excuse. You are ultimately accountable, whether that was ChatGPT or whether that was a different tool, like an autocomplete tool that was assisting you to write. It makes no difference. You're accountable. And these things aren't complicated, right? And we're seeing organizations that can see that this isn't a, 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 a quantum leap for them to be able to pull together these kind of policies and just a pragmatic about it, enable all parts of their organization to be able to leverage it and then don't need to micromanage the whole process. Yeah, some of those legal uh, implications are still unfolding. You know, there's there's all sorts of legal cases unfolding at the moment where people are suing the large language model saying they're responsible for selling a $45,000 car because of the chatbot, <laughs> you know, yes. went ahead and did that. Um, so I think... You know, that's a, an area that a lot of people are, are watching very closely. And I totally agree with you, that human in the loop. And um, one of the things when we're working with companies is how do we make these policies and frameworks set people up for success? So give them the, gu the guardrails so that they don't fail when they're, when they're implementing these tools, but really not coming from a punitive punishing. Because it's, it's one of the things I'm fascinated about at the moment is seeing companies who still see AI as cheating and I'm paying these staff to show up and do their job and if they're using AI they're cheating and I don't know if you see that at all it's a oh. to me quite a backward backward viewpoint um but Look, once we, you get past that then then you're in the area of opportunity absolutely and, and one of the things so I'm an adjunct professor at a number of universities at both University of Queensland and Queensland University of Technology and obviously the universities uh, take very different approaches to the usage of AI. So, for example, at University of Melbourne, they effectively consider the use of any generative AI technologies as cheating. You can get expelled from the university. I fundamentally disagree with that. On all levels, I disagree with that. Luckily, at University of Queensland, where I, where I teach the fourth-year business analytics strategy courses, uh, they don't. So it gets left up to the lecturers. And I'm very open about this, right? I'm very open with the students. I see it as my job as the lecturer to be able to formulate questions that will have students not be able to just simply put it into ChatGPT and get an answer, but there's a level of their input involved in that. I see ChatGPT as helping them, similar to the way I see a calculator helping us multiply and add numbers as well together. I see it as helping them potentially creating that first rough draft and the structure on what they would do and help them with their thinking. But at some point, number one, we want to see what their thinking is about. And I don't need an AI detector to be able to see what's been written by ChatGPT. It is so blindingly obvious nowadays. It's Delve, it, unleash, the ever-evolving. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the unrivaled. All this like it's just the hyperbole is just clear, especially especially when a student's writing a, a recommendation for the usage of analytics to solve a problem. No, you shouldn't be unleashing an unrivaled solution that will provide exceptional like no, in the ever evolving landscape of analytics. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's just crystal clear. But 
I'm I'm definitely not against it, and and I support students' usage and try and uh, assist with that. Now that means in some of the coursework that we do, we need to guide that. We can't just say you can use it, but leave them on their own. There has to be a level of guidance around that which we provide. But very much so, similarly in an organisation, absolutely, I, I support the usage of these tools. We just need to recognise that there can be thorny legal issues around who owns the output of ChatGPT, uh, what am I allowed to put in there? Clearly nothing private or confidential, uh, but what other things are okay? That that template, it spits out a, a couple of ideas. Does ChatGPT own it? Does OpenAI own it or do we own it? So we need to make sure we're on top of these kind of things as an organization before being fully fledged and just leveraging it. And, and like some organizations will do in the marketing space is just spewing out 100 blogs a day of ChatGPT generated content for SEO purposes. Like we don't, I don't want to see my company doing these kind of things like that. Um, a question for you, because you might actually be someone who can answer it. Um, I'm always fascinated at this mis, well, I don't know if it is a misconception, but of course, if you've got proprietary data that is critical to your company, don't go uploading it anywhere where you don't have some kind of control over the safety of that. But how could that come back on companies if they're uploading information from an analytics perspective or an analysis perspective into, say, a large language model, can that data just be pulled out and replicated somewhere else in a way that exposes that company? So it, it, uh, it's happened a number of times that companies, and, and clearly some publicise and some not, it's happened a number of times that companies have uploaded stuff they shouldn't. Now let's think about what could happen next in the next couple of steps when you upload it. So what the what a lot of historically the agreements have been with these large language models is anything you upload we can use as training data. Okay, so what that means in in the trillions of of text tokens that get fed into these things to be able to train them, to be able to output the coherent text that they do, uh, one of those is going to be yours. Now, if yours is very unique and of a specific flavor, a possibility could be, for example, if I ask can you tell me Kate's marketing strategy for doing this and you're the only person in the world that does it, there's a chance that if it's learnt it and and what these models tend to do by having billions and billions of parameters, they they and this has been the conundrum always with these deep neural networks, how do they work? Because we typically overfit them when we train them. So we have more parameters sometimes even than, than we'll have data points and that shouldn't work from a machine learning perspective. It should lead to, to a heavily biased... Uh, sorry, not a heavily biased, a model that's got too much variance, it's learning noise, and it's not actually learning how to uh, properly predict what's coming next. And one of those things could be it could learn by heart your training data that you've put up there, right? It could probably learn that off by heart. And and then if someone were to write the exact right type of prompt, there's a risk that it could output the data that you've put in in the form that you've put it in, right? That's a risk. So how what likely is that? Kate's biggest competitor, what stops... Kate's biggest competitor feeding inaccurate information about Kate's business into a large language model and having the large language model then start to associate that. Because, Nothing. Nothing. Right. They could totally upload that kind of thing and it could be trended. Again, I think if we think pragmatically, uh, it, it may or may not be successful, but it just depends on how much data is in, in that uh, large language model, how many, how much text it's been trained on that's relevant to yourself. So if it has almost nothing that it's managed to scrape from the public web relevant on you, then and they've gone and swamped it with a whole heap of data that it's gone and trained on. Again, we don't know exactly what these organizations do and how they train and how they manage that data and all this kind of stuff. So it's a bit of a black box for the average say, consumer like yourself and myself. So we don't know exactly what it could look like, but there's definitely a, a risk that, that something like that could happen. I mean, you but can't it's... have one without the other. So I would no. think from an open AI perspective, they're probably not wanting their data or their models to, to be, be trained so much yeah. on the input because you can't have one without the other. So how, no. who decides what, what that is? But, but it's no different to, to someone publishing a blog post, talking nonsense about yourself, I guess, what's happened is it's been obfuscated into that large language model. Mm. Uh, whereas if it was a blog post, you'd be able to see the website and you go, well, that's got nothing to do with Kate. I, I know that's not Kate's website, so I know that's nonsense. Whereas now it's hidden in that black box mm. that, it, that it comes out uh, with, with kind of like this authority that it's actually not. And we've seen examples that with Gemini where Google was thoroughly panned 
when they came out with these suggestions that were just hilarious around um, how do I make cheese stick to the top of a pizza? And it managed to pull this post from Reddit where someone said, add one eighth a cup of glue to the pizza and then bake it. And that will help it stick to the pizza. Another brilliant one was how many pebbles should I eat to maintain a healthy diet? And it then started quoting a university, I think in California, around the number of pebbles that should be eaten to ensure that you can maintain. It's just like it, it comes up with nonsense. It's already doing stuff like that. And obviously it's going to be a continuous evolution, but there's just a challenge when you're putting in that much text. And even though they're doing reinforcement learning by human feedback, these kind of approaches, there's just a limit to how much mess it can, it can clear out and actually produce truthful responses like that. Well, Reddit's just blocked all AI models that they don't have a licensing agreement with. Correct. So. correct. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see a bit less of the, uh, the Reddit solutions. Exactly. Uh, and then, you know, Microsoft Copilot was saying it didn't care whether people lived or died at one point in February this year. So um, I think they're some of the things that, you know, put that, that caution in people's minds from a business perspective. So, Evan, we've talked a lot about what can go wrong. I'd love, as we start to wrap up, um, to hear about a success story that you might have where an AI project really overcame some significant challenges and, you know, delivered great results for a company, just so we leave people slightly inspired. Look, there, there are many projects like that. In fact, in the book, we talk about the distinction between analytically immature and analytically mature organisations. What we find is analytically immature organisations have failure rates actually well in excess of 80%. It's probably over 90%. Our, our best estimates show. And analytically mature organizations probably only have failure rates around the 40% mark. And so both me and Doug have been very fortunate to work with a number of analytically mature organizations. And one of those that I've worked with for, for a long time has been the Fraunhofer Sharma Center. And the Fraunhofer Sharma Center, we built a platform called Industrial Path Solutions. And I still am an affiliated expert with the organization, even have, after having left Sweden 10 years ago. Um, and we've built this platform that helps manufacturers program and automate the spot and stud welding of their robots, their, their uh, assembly line robots, the ABB and cooker robots that are used to manufacture vehicles. And it's been a bewildering success. One of the main objectives, for example, that a client that, that we've worked with for many years, Volvo, and, and they've been, uh, they were an incredible organization to begin the front office Sharma Center's journey with because they didn't want to own the IP to begin with. So effectively, it helped seed the organization with a lot of its uh, a lot of the early stage intellectual property and Volvo's attitude with this was, hey, look, if these systems of all we got as a competitive advantage, then we may as well shut our doors as a car manufacturer. What we'd rather have is the development and growth of this shared by automotive manufacturers around the world, and that was incredibly successful. GM use it, Ford use it, um, Porsche, Volvo, Mercedes Benz, Volvo, uh, all, all Saab, all the major manufacturers use it around the world. And it has been incredibly successful in helping organizations achieve one of the most important milestones in the manufacturing of vehicles. And that's reducing the cycle time between we need to create a new vehicle and when it actually hits a road. Historically, that was around five years, right? Between the, the, the latest vehicles gone out, now we're starting to design a new one and we want to get it to consumers. The goal of the projects that, that we've worked on was to reduce that to three years, almost halving it. And that was pushing everything into the digital world. So everything needed to be modeled from the actual, can we even fit this chassis down the production line to create it through to how do we model the paint process? So it comes up with a finished job to looking at the split lines on a vehicle, which are the lines between where the panels come together to make sure that there isn't a lot of variation. So it actually looks well designed and well produced. All that whole process has been impacted enormously by the digitization of it. And they can do that because they operate at scale. That's not necessarily a story that everyone in every small business around the world can leverage. And, I, and, I, and when I talk to a lot of small businesses, I really emphasize this around the fact that, look, AI systems are expensive if you want to build it yourself. If you want to build one from scratch, these things are incredibly expensive. So you better have the scale to take advantage of the slight efficiency improvement that's going to arise out of this. You, you better be able to benefit from this because if you're not you're going to want to get it off the shelf but that type of project that i've worked with now for over 15 years has been an unmitigated success globally and it's helped the automotive industry worldwide massively improve their entire manufacturing processes from from start to finish 
Oh, amazing. I'm really looking forward to reading your book, which I know is eminent, um, to see some more of those success stories and, and learn from some of the other failures. Um, now, Evan, I always like to ask as we start to wrap up, what is your favourite AI tool and why? Look, that, that, that's a great question. And I think I want to kind of almost cause a few gasps and, 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 and shocks with, with my answer to say, hey, in the book, we emphasise the critical need to start small and to start just, just building things and trialling ideas. One of the best tools to do that, Excel or Google Sheets. So it's just a great starting point just to start playing around, a little sandpit to muck around in. Now, if, if that's not your tool, and I, I have to admit I get endlessly frustrated by that, then I think the, there's wonderful tools out there, especially for those with a bit of coding knowledge, like Jupyter Notebooks for Python. And that's a great tool to go to from if Excel just doesn't cut it and you get annoyed by it too much and you've actually got a level of, of databases and other things that you can you can leverage to, to be able to pull data out and to access in, in, a, in a smarter fashion, then leveraging Jupyter Notebooks with Python and other tools like that is brilliant. Python isn't necessarily the fastest language to build cutting edge and, and super fast code with, but to be able to get stuff up and running and especially the way that Jupyter Notebooks allow you to visualize intermediate results and get feedback and update things very quickly uh, is incredibly powerful. And the fact that you can have it locally available on your machine and be able to run it through a browser, I'm a huge fan of it. I've, I've got a lot of mileage out of Jupyter Notebooks in my time. And so I think kind of they're the two starting pot, spots where, where I often think that, that people can go a long way and begin with. And in fact, one of the greatest stories that, that I love sharing is my younger brother's a chef. And uh, a while ago, he came to me with this idea of how to leverage AI tools to automate the creation of recipes. Now, one of the greatest failure stories on that front was, uh, was Chef Watson from IBM that would come up with all these generic recipes and things that sometimes were good and sometimes just made no sense. And they eventually shut the service down. But my younger brother was focused in one niche area of leveraging AI, and he wanted to build this AI tool to automatically create recipes. And I said to him, first off, just do it in Excel. Start with Excel. You've got enough Excel skills to do it on your own. And we're going to begin that journey that I talked about from zero to one. He can start playing around with it. He played around in Excel. We built out some AI tools that could automatically generate recipes, and the thing worked amazingly. And he's gotten a huge amount of mileage over a year of, of developing these recipes and, and people have been able to confirm they work brilliantly, unlike Chef Watson. And now he's at that point after about a year or two of playing around with it, say, okay, now I'm going to take the next step and begin upgrading. And so I think it's, an, it's a great tool for many organizations to begin with Excel. And if you're beyond that, the Jupyter Notebooks are the next best bet. Yeah, so as someone who's not so much an Excel fan, I have to say that numerous.ai has been one of my favorite tools to really unlock uh, Excel because it turns an Excel spreadsheet into more of that conversational, which works nice. really well for me as a conversationalist, um, to be able to converse with data and do all sorts of things in, in Excel. So, um, yes, I, I didn't audibly gasp, but I wouldn't put <laughs> Excel in the uh, no. favourite well, AI tool category, but I love that. I am biased. I am biased. <laughs> as someone who's technically on the tool still, uh, it's often my first go-to tool. If, if you're not going to be building the models yourself and you're in an organization i totally agree just chat gpt and all the other variations of it are wonderful intermediaries to be able to uh, boost your organization but it really does depend on the use case there's yeah. so many tools that i could rattle off that that would be only relevant for that group of people who are facing that problem Fantastic. So last thoughts, Evan, as you stand on the hill and look out 12 to 24 months in the future, what's coming? What can we expect in the world of AI? Thinking from more of that, you know, medium-sized business opportunity or even personally, what's coming down the line with AI? Oh, if, if I could prognosticate on this one, I think I'm worried about backlash. I'm worried that the AI bubble is going to burst. So that's one of my biggest things in my mind that I think, and, and a lot of people are already talking about this for quite a while. So, so the, the publication of the book, the Why Data Science Projects Fail book that me and Doug are doing is, is very timely because it's going to land on a point in time where people are saying, this could be the inflection point where a lot of the, what, what some people are seeing as overinvestment could, could recalibrate, right? I'm saying, I think there's a non-zero chance of that genuinely occurring that there could be the, the bubble could burst over the next 12 to 24 months. Now, from a user perspective, if you're asking me like what type of technologies 
uh, could we be seeing? I think that that's, this kind of prognostication is fraught with enormous difficulties, but let's just extend the line a little bit. I won't hold to, you to, to it. 12 months out is not a long way. And really what I think we're going to see is more embedding of these text and 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 visual and sound-based tools into more products around it. People are going to come up with even more use cases. You're going to see it getting embedded across more things, even like chats like this, uh, video conferencing, uh, all our day-to-day tools, the productivity of them is going to increase. And we're, we're just going to see it embedding itself in more and more in that. We're going to be more and more used to AI tools, I think, uh, across a lot of different things. And what I think it's not going to be in the next 12 to 24 months is this kind of artificial intelligence operating system. It's just going to be embedded across everything. It's going to be people always talk about, oh, my phone's going to know and book and it's going to, oh, I wanted a restaurant or book the re-. No, no, no. Let's figure all that for a moment. What it's going to be is lots of point use cases that are getting more advanced, more, they're going to be easier to use and, and, and more consumers are going to get into them. I think that's going to be what we're going to see over the next little while. I love that you say that because I talk a lot about, you know, the 50% thrilled and exhilarated at the potential and 50% terrified about, and I think that's how a lot of people feel is, um, you know, there's there's absolutely going to be backlash from whole industries. We're already seeing it in Hollywood and actors and, you know, there's another strike that they're talking about today. And um, I think there's, you know, I keep telling people, buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride for the next few years. And that's why I'm really passionate about this podcast is a place where we can have those real conversations about it and not just have it be this evangelistic pro-tech sort of or pro-AI uh, solution to everything in our life. Thank you so much, Evan, for being with me today. It's been an amazing conversation. As I said, I love talking with people who can actually take us under the hood and talk about what it really is. Um, so thanks so much for being here today. Uh, absolute pleasure, Kate. Thank you for letting me, me join the podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the AI Grapple. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We would love to hear your thoughts, so reach out with any questions or comments about the show. Until next time, keep grappling with AI and stay curious. From the big challenges to easy.